Welcome. My name is Paul Mitchell. I'm a professor of agriculture and applied economics here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And this is a lecture I'm doing for my AAE 320 class. The lecture title is The Moron Principle, and it's why farmers use inputs like they do. My focus today is on a common paradox I've found in farm management over my years of experience. Um, it's mostly I, I've seen these claims for, for many years a farmer, that farmers overuse some inputs, and these inputs that they're overusing cause environmental pollution. I'm focusing on fertilizer and pesticides are probably the two most common ones, but it's broader than just that. And this is always this is something I've run into my whole career, um, and this is something that's always bothered me. It's agriculture in general is a very tight margin industry. Um, the farmers aren't making a lot of money on a, a per hectare per acre basis um, or for their hours spent, the assets, the rates of return on them. So why would be farmers be wasting money on inputs they don't need? Um, we've been various stories about this, you know, it's an information deficit problem. We need more education extension um, to educate them and then they'll make better decisions about adopting these best management practices. Because we spent a lot of time and energy in these various departments showing that these practices, um, you know, nutrient testing for soil testing, for example, or tissue testing, um, maybe integrated pest management to do scouting and then, um, and then make insecticide applications, you can show these are win-win um, for the farmer and the um, you, in the sense that profit goes up and um, we use less of the inputs. But they don't seem to adopt them. So we need more education, outreach, show them that they work. Maybe it's risk. They just, they're just they nervous about the production risk that these generates, and they're using this extra inputs to um, manage that risk. So maybe insurance is a way to get around it or just some sort of way to help them understand that risk and manage it better so they use less inputs. Often there's a test trust risk or a technology risk, you know, integrated pest management. You might not trust the scouting. Overall, just a, a risk that you're concerned about is the science isn't quite as good as it, they make it sound. A common response to this is demonstration trials, you know, show them how that works and then show them how the fields look better or just as good either way and you save more money. Um, other ones are just pay people to adopt these practices. As USDA has various subsidy programs and cost share programs for farmers to adopt various technologies for these best management practices that are supposed to make um, their system um, better. They use fewer inputs or more efficiently use the inputs and they make more money. Or sometimes we just pass regulations to force them to adopt these various practices. But um, this is always, all this as a social scientist has always bothered me. Um, with all, these pro all these methods, and there's other ones out there I'm not going over, help, but they never solve this problem and, uh, of, you know, of nitrogen leaching and runoff, of phosphorus runoff, of um, pesticide um, leaching and runoff. I, I really think a lot of this is we just don't understand the former men mentality, what they're really thinking through. Um, that we, it's not they're wasting money in these inputs. There's something that's they find some value to it. Um, we're trying to understand what that source of value is, the benefit they're getting. And I have the, my, my theory on this right now is something called the moron principle. And I'll explain it. Um, and this is in a standard way. I'll explain what I'm going to tell you, then I'll tell it to you, then I'll summarize what I told you. Um, and there's these three stylized facts I like to use to understand this situation. Um, I think the production function, first off, becomes non-responsive or inelastic or flat um, to um, the yield um, at near or at optimal levels. It just gets very flat. And so you get small profit changes that are going to occur because you're even with wide ranges of inputs. And so the yield doesn't change a lot. Profits go down a little bit because you're spending money on this input. But um, what you get then is a wide range of input levels are going to be consistent with maximizing profit or very close to maximizing profit. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Also, um, so you get a lot of non-responsiveness up there at the optimal levels. Um, in, the other one is there's lots of variability. On average, those response curves are very flat up there at the optimal levels, but there's so many other sources of variability that um, the, the response to the fertilizer, or yield to the fertilizer or the pest um, management input is buried in all this other variability that's going on. And so as a result, you can't really identify that your input has had an impact. Um, and so even science has a hard time identifying what's economically optimal. That, that response curve is just so um, difficult to identify relative to all the other um, variability going on. Then the last part is the fact that underuse is often obvious, but overuse is invisible and the inputs are relatively low cost. Um, and so we'll talk more about this in a minute, but it's pretty obvious when you 
have, um, if you put on an extra fertilizer, you don't see a change. But if you're short of fertilizer, you do notice the crop is um, deficient in various nutrients. So the overuse is not noticeable, but the underuse is. And these inputs are so low cost relative to what you're spending on other things and the overall value of the crop. And so a common human response in, situation like, in situations like this is to put a little more on, and hence the name, the moron principle. And I think this helps me understand the, what's the, the rationale that farmers are using that's driving this overuse of some of these inputs. And based off of this knowledge, then maybe we can start building the programs and policies to help address these issues. So this is the first slide I have on this, and it's kind of, it's a theoretical or abstract explanation that's meant to apply to a wide variety of cases. Horizontal axis is the input level, the vertical axis is the yield, and what farmers are doing is farming this flat function. Um, the first applications of these inputs, you know, be it fertilizer or pesticides or whatever, are very valuable. You put on a little bit more fertilizer, your yield jumps up, and it's very obvious that it has a positive impact on yield. But eventually, the function bends over and gets very flat. And this is our production function. And what you see is up here at the optimal and near optimal levels, it just gets very flat. And so it's non-responsive. You add more fertilizer, and there's not a big change or even much of a noticeable change in yield. Um, you go to the, um, then when you go to profit, which is just price times this um, yield minus any input cost, you, get, you add a little more fertilizer, maybe 10, 15% more fertilizer, yield doesn't change very much, if at all, and you spend a little bit more money in these low cost inputs, and so your profit goes down and you get this long, slow decline in profit up here at higher input levels as you're paying for inputs that don't have a large impact on the um, yield, but they don't also don't cost very much. And so you see this very common here when you get this profit curve, um, there's, where's the maximum exactly? And if you miss it by 10% or 15%, it doesn't really affect your profit. It's really hard to notice a difference over here on the vertical axis over a wide range of these input levels. And so we'll look here at an example. Um, this is based off some old data from Iowa. These are standard research trials. This is corn. You change fertilizer rate across the horizontal axis here, and you have the yield on the vertical axis. And these are, you know, three, or, um, these are like, um, four, six, eight row plots, and you take the middle rows, um, and then you have standardized um, app, uh, methods of, of treatment. Only thing that varies is fertilizer rates, and you har harvest the yields, and you estimate the overall yield for the, at the field level, um, if you blew that plot up. And you replicate, you have um, many, tr you have randomly allocated out there on the landscape in this one location in one year. And that's, these are, these are um, fertilizer rate going all the way from zero to 300 pounds. This is early, um, 2000s in Iowa at one location. And a couple things I want you to see. First off, I've normalized it for as a percent of the maximum. So in this case here, the maximum yield was here on the 300 bushels per acre, or 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre, gave you the highest yield. All these other ones are reported as a percent of that, that point there. So that one's 100%. For example, over here at low input, no fertilizer, you still get somewhere around 35, 40% of the average yield that you got off of the, um, that one spot there. Um, that one plot that did so well. And you can see all the other ones are um, reflected as a percent of that, as a, how, what proportion they are of that one spot. Um, first off you see is the early in, input application here, fertilizer yields go up, but then somewhere around 125 or so, it really flattens out. The other thing you'll see then is also the high variability. Even with 300 pounds per acre, you got a plot that did whatever the maximum was, and another one is as low as 85% of that maximum. So assuming 200 bushel per acre corn, um, in today's world, would be very easy to do in parts of Iowa, 15% um, difference at $3 corn is still $30 per acre revenue difference. Um, even with 300 pounds of fertilizer, you can get the maximum 200 or maybe 15% um, less than that, so 30 bushels. Um, 90, $3, um, it's $90, um, a wide range of um, input, or I'm sorry, of output, outcome, you know, yield um, ranges over that single fertilizer application rate, a huge rate of 300 pounds per acre, which is very large. And you see that wide variability um, this way, and then you see the flatness of the curve in the other way if you change the input. You go to um, you several places in the states, or in various states from the same study, and all you see is that flattening out of the curve happens all over the place. This is, again, corn and nitrogen in various locations in Indiana, Iowa, Pennsylvania, and two um, research stations in Minnesota. Um, these are the averages of all the plots. So here, we'll do the black line for Iowa. These are about 3,000 plots are averaging to make that line. Um, and see, 
the zero fertilizer, the average is just below 50% of maximum yield. And then even at the, all, all the plots at about 250 hit at the maximum, the average of all the plots that had 250 pounds per acre was about 90% of the maximum. And so you can see, flattens out in Iowa. Here's a purple for um, <clears throat> Indiana. Flattens around about 75 um, pounds per acre. Wasika flattened out, you know, about 100, 125. It's very flat. Same thing in Morris, um, flattens out at about 75 pounds per acre. Um, Pennsylvania, the same thing. Not a lot of responsive to fertilizer once you get up to about the 100 pounds per acre or something like that. Those averages, on average, it's very flat. I haven't talked about the variability. We saw that in the previous slide. That average for this blue line is, um, you know, about 95% up here, 90, 95%. But there's a lot of variability around it, like you saw in the previous slide. Well, you put this all together, what's this effect have on the optimal fertilizer rate? You have that flat yield curve, you get a flat profit um, curve as well. And so this is the current nitrogen recommendations for the state of Wisconsin. And this is in high yield potential soils, um, corn, um, corn, corn rotation, corn following corn. And the price ratio matters. We've gone through that in my class already. You know, it's the ratio of the corn, I'm sorry, the nitrogen price to the corn price or what we've been calling R over P. That price ratio is important for determining the economic optimum. And, um, and so on this axis is fertilizer rate. This, this is the net returns to the nitrogen without including all the other costs of production. When you hit these stars, note the optimum. And then these bars here show at those different price ratios, the range that gets you within $1 um, dollar per acre of that optimum. So for example, um, we'll go here to, you know, at this optimum is about what, 160 maybe. Um, but you can see anywhere from like 107 or 8, or I'm sorry, 130 pounds per acre all the way up to 170 pounds per acre, something like that. A wide range of fertilizer rates get you within $1 per acre of that optimum. As the price ratio gets higher, nitrogen becomes relatively more expensive um, in terms of corn. Um, you can see it gets tighter, but it's still quite the range. Even here at this really high price ratio of 0 0.2, you can still see it's um, the fertilizer rate um, comes down, but it's still a wide range of rates are consistent, get you within one dollar per acre of the optimum. So here's a card. It's um, on the back side um, will be that figure, something like that. But the front side, this side will have the um, some of the price ratios. And currently, um, we're at about a 0.15 price ratio with about three dollar corn and forty five cent per acre, or per pound fertilizer cost for nitrogen. And then we'll, here's the high yield potential. It's corn following some sort of corn versus a soybean. You can see the optimum is 130, 105. But I really want to emphasize this wide range, 120 to 145 in that high yield potential for corn following some sort of corn crop. Um, you know, that's a 25 um, pound per acre yield difference, or I'm sorry, fertilizer difference. Here it's about 20 pounds, um, 20, 25 pounds. You can go to the other soils and other um, situations. Of, you know, it's 20 to 25 pounds. Again, that's from that low end to the high end of the range that gets you within $1 per acre, per acre of the profit max. Well, corn following corn, you put those numbers in, it's somewhere between $54 to $65 per acre in cost. If you go to the corn following soybeans, it's somewhere between $43 to $52 per acre. It's a $9 to $11 per acre range in the amount of fertilizer you apply. Um, that's quite a bit. And especially if they all give you about the same profit outcome. That's a lot of extra fertilizer if you don't need it or why are they, you know, there's a big range. It's all about the same in terms of the profitability. So what's what's going a farmer going to do faced with that broad range of outcomes of, of input levels that give you all about the same outcome? So um, a couple things we want to note then is nutrient deficiencies are often quite obvious, but um, overuse won't be. So here's a nutrient deficiencies. Here, this is a, some pictures from an Iowa State University publication. Where here, this is like a wet field, and the spring was wet. The nitrogen becomes unavailable, and the corn turns yellow. It's short of nitrogen. Um, it, these other parts were drier and they had plenty of nitrogen. You can see in here, it turns yellow. Here's later in the season when the corn's more fully developed, but it shows all the classic symptoms of nitrogen shortage with the yellowing down the middle of the ear or of the leaf and the tips being yellow. Um, the, this is um, a diagnostic. It shows you all the different um, nutrient or other problems and how they tend to look on the leaves, how to, how to diagnose it. So a normal corn leaf, here's one with phosphorus is short. You can see the purpling on the edges. Potassium makes yellow, defic potassium deficiency makes yellow on the edges. Here's our nitrogen with the tip and then up the middle, as opposed to the outside edges for potassium. Nitrogen is up the middle. Magnesium gets this uh, characteristic of, this, of the stripes down the leaves. Drought, water shortage is short. You get the curling up of the leaves, diseases. 
causing yield losses. It can often get splotchy and spotty, depends on the disease. You know, lately we've been dealing with tar spot. They'll be dark instead of light, but there's lots of other problems at plants and they all tend to be spotty as opposed to um, long bands and such. And then there's chemical burns from like maybe a herbicide drift or uh, some other issue like that. And it's just to help farmers understand. And the quickly, the thing to note is deficiencies are often very obvious and there's ways to diagnose what the heck input is short. But what does corn look like if it's had too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus, or too much pesticide? It looks great. Um, that's what, this is an example of what a great looking corn field is. It looks, it's early in the season yet. Corn looks healthy. It doesn't have any insect problems. doesn't have any nutrient deficiencies. It looks really healthy. What if so, if you have an optimum and you put on an extra 10, 15%, the corn is still going to look great. If you put on um, herbicide and you, didn't, you don't, um, or insecticide, and you say you don't have any insects show up, um, you look out there, the corn looks great. But what does a field look like if you had too little? You see the nutrient deficiency problems. We saw those on the other slide. You look out in the field, you see weeds, you see um, insect damage, you see fungal problems, you know, pathogens, diseases on the plant. It's very obvious if you applied an insecticide and it didn't work or you should have applied one and didn't. You see insects eating your corn, you see weeds in the crop, you see diseases on the plant leaves. If you put on too much or you put on something you didn't need, it looks great. Um, and so you, you see this um, overuse is um, um, not obvious. The corn looks great, it's invisible overuse is, but underuse, it shows up right away. You can quickly see these obvious um, symptoms to diagnose that you're short. So it's not just these inputs, it's also other things. You see the same issue, here's seeds now, and these are those same response curves um, for the different price ratios of the price of seed to the price of corn, R over P we've been talking about. Um, you know, you got your various one, one and a half, two, two and a half. As the seed gets more expensive, you cut back and plant fewer seeds per acre. This is the density of plants per acre. And it's the same thing. Again, if you're short, you have fewer plants per acre. You look out in your field and you see various plants missing because something ate the seed um, or didn't grow up, um, it didn't grow well. And so you're short, but if you put on too many, it looks fine. You get, you get a nice stand. Um, same thing, plants per acre on the, at harvest time. Here's your returns for the different price ratios, what's the optimal number of plants to have? You know, 36,000 if you got low seed costs, 33, 30, 27, 23,000. Um, we're somewhere in this range here, and you can kind of see that same thing is, there's a wide range of seeding densities that give you within a dollar per acre of the economic optimum. So 33,000 at this price ratio might be the economically um, optimal amount of seeds to plant, but you can get by with less than 30,000, as many as 36, 37,000 and still be within a dollar. So a wide range of seeding rates give you the, exactly the same um, profit and yield outcomes. Um, and so you're, so do you use more or not? Um, what, what seeding rate do you use? Do you use 33,000, do you use 32, 31, 30, or do you use 36, 37,000? It almost doesn't matter. And each of those seeds will have different seed treatments on them, um, creating more or less um, in night, um, those seed treatments getting in the environment. Um, so you switch over, same thing for soybeans. This is um, seeds, again, on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the profitability returns, you know, ignoring all these other costs. Much more recent work from some folks I worked with in the US or the UW agronomy department. See that same problem here. This is the $9 soybeans. This is the $12 soybeans. This is the dotted line is the untreated seed. Um, Apron Max is a fungicide. The Cruiser Max is fungicide plus an insecticidal seed treatment. You can see the fungicide, the gains and yield are pretty much pay for them exactly. The profitability is very different than, no different than untreated seed. You spend more for the fungicide, $55 for a bag of um, seed, but um, you gain back about $55 worth of soybeans. So there's very little effect on your profitability with that um, fungicide. But the one thing I really want to focus in on is the, again, you see that long, slow decline in the profit function um, as you go to higher and higher seeds. You gain, you're spending the relatively low cost um, relative to the yield gain. There's not much yield gain, but it's um, low cost for the input. And so you get that wide, flat profit response. And so where's the optimum? Maybe somewhere around 90, 95,000. You go to 12 dollars soybeans, maybe around 100,000. But you could really plan a wide range around that and still get about the same um, profitability. The same thing shows up in these um, soybeans and um, with the seeds in there. Now we'll switch to um, the different input in a different crop. This is work I did on sweet corn back in the early 2000s, again, or mid 2000s, I should say. 
And this is an insecticide called Capture by Fenthrin. It's, it's, it's a pyrethroid. That's its active ingredient name. And this is processing sweet corn. This is um, the kind that goes into cans or it gets frozen. Um, this is the number of sprays they use. You know, they're scheduled over time. Um, or, and this is the returns um, after ca capturing after you've, you know, it hasn't removed all these other costs yet or anything. But you can see you do zero, one, two, three, four sprays with capture. And you see the same thing. No sprays, you get a lower profit, about, I don't know, $75 per acre is your average returns. And then you quickly jumps up with one spray to well over 200 and then has a long, slow decline. So the yield response to this insecticide spray really flattens out. Um, and then see all that variability. I didn't plot the points. Instead, I plotted the 95% confidence interval or error bars. So with three sprays, 95% of the time, you're going to be between almost like, I don't know, 90 to 305, something like that. So there's quite a range of profit returns with that third, when you plot three sprays. But it's, the same, it's almost exactly the same range as you get with one, two, or three, or four sprays. The sprays, in terms of their impact and profit, our mini school impacts relative to all the other sources of variability out there that it's really hard scientifically if you do stats testing you can't separate the yield um, and the profitability returns differences between one two three or four sprays the variability is so tremendous that the effect of insecticide sprays on your profits is it's not discernible and buried in all that noise so ask yourself how many sprays did you put on on average, it looks like one is the best deal, but you can see there's so much variability that you wouldn't be able to tell if you put on two that it was a waste. Um, here's um, fresh market sweet corn. A couple things you'll see. First off, a lot more sprays, you know, up to nine, and average returns are much larger because fresh market sweet corn is also much more valuable. And you see that response curve goes up really quickly, um, and then it flattens out up here. It looks like a, a four, five, six sprays. It's about profitable is the maximum profit on average. But again, you see that tremendous amount of variability at five sprays, somewhere between $1,500 an acre all the way up to $3,300, $3,400 an acre, quite the range. And these sprays are so cheap. They're only about $10, even less per acre for a spray of bifenthrin. So as you go up this curve and you put on these extra sprays, they don't improve the average. You have that long, slow decline in your profitability, but buried, it's hard to discern that loss, that overuse in the midst of all that variability from all the other sources that affect your um, yield and profit. I mean, and, and so how many sprays would you use in a situation like this? Um, that's a question because this is what the farmer's faced with. Um, and there's so many other sources of variability in relative to, you know, $3,000 an acre, $2,000 an acre, a $10 spray is what you're making a decision about. You're probably not going to think about it too long. Here's the last one we'll look at. This is a different crop. It's the same issue. Um, and again, um, We'll look at fertilizer. This is potatoes. This is fresh russet potatoes, the kind you buy in a grocery store, the brown ones, um, from a data at a plots done in 2018 at the Hancock Ag Research Station, um, sort of in central part of Wisconsin, just south of Stevens Point, about 30 miles. What you'll see here is fertilizer applied after starter. So you plant some and you put the piece of soup tuber in the ground, and then later on you come by and put on more fertilizer. You can put on 60, 180, 240, 300, 360. These are your traditional rates, somewhere up in here. You see how flat it gets. Um, that first one, yes, definitely valuable versus no fertilizer. It even jumps more when you go up to 180. But then after that, you see the tr how it flattens out. These lines are just the averages of those data points. You can see the average of these is about 500 pounds or 500 hundred weight per acre. Then it drops a little bit to about 480, then goes up to above 500, and then about the same when you go to 360. But you also see that wide range of variability in, fertilizer, um, um, in yields. Potato yields are, get a little tighter up here, but they're actually higher up here in terms of on average than the drop and such. But here you even see here, even at 360 pounds per acre of nitrogen fertilizer, you see a wide range of 100 weight per acre from as low as, um, oh, it's like about 490 all the way up to 590, 100, 100 weight. At even picking a lower price to say $10 100 weight, that's still um, quite a range in, out of, of profitability or revenue outcomes there for a relatively low cost input. Um, even at 50 cents a pound, this is only a $30 per acre increase from going from 300 to 360, but you see a huge range in your profit or revenue outcomes. So you see flattening out of the response curve and the yield variability is tremendous and you're making a decision over something that's $30 an acre, maybe if you add 60 pounds, and this is a crop you've already spent $2,500, $3,000 per acre, and it's worth even more, um, 5000 or more to cover some of your other costs. And so that's what farmers are facing is this 
problem of a flat response curve, lots of sources of variability beyond the one you're worrying about, and overuse is invisible, but underuse is very obvious. So how do you, why do farmers use these inputs like they do? I think these are these three stylized facts. You got that flat response curve, so that a wide range of input levels are gonna be consistent with profit maximizing. Is it 70, is it 80, is it 100? It's really hard to tell whatever input you're using. You get about the same profit, but there's a wide range of input use. And that wide range is sometimes what generates the pollution. Um, all kinds of other sources of variability. And so it's really hard to even identify the effect of the input on the um, economic optimum, the fertilizer effect on yield and then profit or the insecticide use on yield and profit, things like that. The seeds are all really hard to tease those relationships out. Even the scientists can have a hard time identifying statistically what's optimal. And then you get um, this really clear things when you do management. If you're short of the input, you can tell. If you overuse it, it's hard to tell. You don't even notice. Um, and these inputs are relatively low cost compared to the other decisions they're making. So they're facing a lot of non-responsiveness, obviously when you're short, not obvious when you overuse, and it's not a large cost relative to all the other decisions you're making. And so I think a common human response in situations like these is to put a little moron. Um, and that's the term where I get the name, the moron principle. I think most people facing a situation like this would put a little moron. Um, that's, that's just a, to me as a natural human behavior. I think a simple way to think of it for like an undergraduate student is you're going to a job interview. Um, you don't want to be late. It's your, you want the job. It's the one you really want. It's a big deal. Um, your time is relatively low cost, um, like, the, like these inputs are. Overuse is invisible, but underuse is obvious. And that situation is if you get there five minutes early or 10 or 15 minutes early, it's no big deal. It's low cost and um, no one notices. But if you're late, the interviewer will quickly notice. That's um, being short, it's obvious. Being overused, it's not obvious. When you get to the interview, the interviewer has no, no clue that you've been there for 20 minutes or five minutes. And then the imp there's lots of other variability. Maybe you're going to, um, you know, you don't want to be late. And it's in the other side of town, a part of town you've never been to. You got to find the building where you are. You go in the building to meet the person. Um, so there's lots of sources of um, way why you could be short and you're nervous. And there's lots of other things that matter just beyond whether you get the job or not, beyond whether you're late or not. So you just get there on time, give yourself plenty of slack and not worry about it because so many other things are more important to whether you get the job or not than whether you're late. Um, and so that's that wide range of input levels are going to be consistent with getting the job. Um, because so many other factors, there's so many other sources of variability that really determine whether you get the job. Um, and so what do people do in this? They show up early and they're prepared. Um, and that's kind of like the same logic that would drive you to do that is the same logic that would drive a farmer to put a little extra on um, to deal with this um, situation like this. That's what I call the moron principle. So based on this knowledge, I'm hoping we can start using this kind of logic understanding, I should say, to help develop programs and policies that can help us help farmers manage inputs better um, with a little, little less um, losses of the inputs to the environment. Okay.